Okay, so uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Rosa Santi, and I am excited to be your moderator today. Uh, my role at Capgemini is Head of Insights and Data in Finland. I want to welcome you all really warmly to our LinkedIn event, uh, Data Masters Rendezvous, with the event uh, topic of turning net zero ambitions into actions with data. So during our event today, you will learn about our recently launched Data for Net Zero report by Capgemini Research Institute and hear some very insight, interesting ex, uh, insights from it. Uh, we will also discuss today what, why data is the key to turn your net zero ambitions into actions. And uh, we are really happy to flesh out the report insights uh, with two of very inspiring stories from Breitling and Ford um, on what is the role that data plays on their sustainability, environmental sustainability agenda. Uh, we will also then hear from them um, tips and tricks how to get started with your emissions data. Okay, but first, uh, it is actually time to introduce our panelists. So uh, let's start with Vincent first. Hi everyone, uh, very pleased to be here. My name is Vincent de Montalivet. I am the offer leader of Data for Net Zero offering. Great, and let's go to Aurelia then. Hi everyone, my name is Aurelia Figueroa. I'm Glo Global Head of Sustainability at Brightlane and I'm really happy to be here with you today. Looking forward to our discussion. And then we have Wolf Peter, please go ahead. Yeah, hello, I'm with Peter Schmidt. I'm with Ford in Europe and I'm there the Director for Sustainability, Advanced Regulation and Product Conformity. Thank you, everyone. I'm really, really excited to have you here today. Um, before going into the agenda that I just went through, so Vin Vincent, could you actually share for us why this topic is so important today? <laughs> With pleasure, uh, Roussin, uh, let me share um, three main reasons of why it is important. So, first and foremost, uh, climate change is no more a concept that will take place in 2030 or 2050 because of the rise of the temperature if we are not acting now, right? Since I will say, especially this year, it is becoming very concrete for many people all over the world with, again, the hottest year in terms of temperature reach. So we faced, for example, in France, some little tornado in Normandy in June this year. The same occurs in Corse, in Corsica, during the summer, where a camping was completely devastated. And nobody could predict that, right? I was personally affected during my vacation with my family when I saw ashes fell from the sky because our forest was burning. And these examples are not only from France, right? We can see actually coming from all over the world this year. Secondly, the regulations. It is something very important because regulations is accelerating the pressure to find a way to oblige organization to report on their sustainability data, especially their green gas, gas emission, either in Europe with the foundation under the so-called UO taxonomy, the SFDR and CSRD, but also in the US, where the SEC are expected to release their rules by the end of the year after several months of discussion with many stakeholders across the country. So mandatory disclosure may probably start in 2024. So last reason, but not least, is that net zero is your foundation for data-driven transformation journey. In other words, there is no net zero position without understanding the full end-to-end -end life cycle cost of your business. How your supplier are acting, how you are producing your goods, how your consumer use your products and services. And this is a huge opportunity, not only to drive net zero, 
but also in completely redefining the efficiency and effectiveness of your business. It is not at all about reporting only, but also about managing your net zero. And this drives a lot of direct business benefits and for sure will deliver some next level of competitive advantage. Thank you, Vincent. I think those are excellent three points to get us all on the same page uh, of why we talk about this topic today, right? Uh, okay, uh, but um, let's go a little bit deeper into our uh, panelists today and our guests. So uh, first, I would actually have a question um, for Aurelia, or if you could start. So I would like to, I would like you to share a little bit more about your role and responsibilities at the moment uh, in your company. So um, and also, can you share a little bit about why did your company actually started this journey uh, of, of really um, go, going deeper or more serious about sustain environmental sustainability specifically? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rosa, and thank you for the introduction, Vincent. I think that the weight that you've given to the subject, it's definitely something that we're familiar with, but that we can duly be reminded of for sure. So in my role at Brightlane as the inaugural head of sustainability, I work on this topic along with our dedicated sustainability team across the issues of product, planet, people, progress, and prosperity. For those of you who may not be familiar with Brightlane, it's a heritage Swiss watch brand. We were founded originally in 1884 and we're operating globally today. And as a part of our commitment to, to sustainability, and especially if we look at product, then we're really concerned at how our products are being sourced. What are the social impacts along the value chain, the environmental impacts along the value chain, obviously recognizing the intersectionality of social and environmental impacts. How can we guarantee product integrity by really ensuring that we know where our products and our raw materials are coming from and under the, con the conditions under which they were produced? So as you can imagine, imagine supplier engagement is a key aspect there. That obviously has a clear intersection with our planet objectives. So we at Brightlane are committed to the science-based targets initiative. We're in the progress of preparing to submit our targets for validation early next year. And what we really saw as key is being able to obviously have data in place to support that process. And then of course, to track emissions reductions as we proceed. So being able to measure what is the impact of our transition to 100% renewable energy globally, which we intend to complete by 2025, if not sooner, act of engaging along key value chains that are accounting for a substantial portion of our emissions, such as the gold value chain, to make sure that we can work directly with our suppliers and share knowledge, share resources, including financial resources, including knowledge-based resources, in order to support their transition as well, while at the same time, of course, learning from them, because I think this is really an ecosystem where a lot is happening and where we all have a lot to share with each other and to really drive progress moving forward. And I'll, I'll focus on those subjects for now. We can definitely get into the others later, but when we talk about why this journey, um, we're, we are currently not subject to any regulatory pressure to do so. These are voluntary measures that we are taking, but we, we see them as absolutely impingent upon us as a member of society to make our contribution within our sphere of influence to these issues that are defining our world today. So that's why we've been working on it. We obviously see it as a key way to continue to build these really strong relationships we have with supply chain partners on a values-driven basis. So those are just a few of the topics that come to mind and I'm really looking forward to diving deeper into them later in the discussion too. Thanks a lot, Aurelia. I think that was a very comprehensive answer and we will definitely dive into those topics also uh, today. Um, later more um how about wolf peter could you please um uh, share also about what you work with today and also about a little bit about Ford's Ford journey how did you get started right of course um so first you asked for my my role so my my department is basically looking at the sustainability strategy in, in europe and the sustainability report input from a european perspective 
And the second area is about environmental and safety regulations uh, in Europe. And the third one is compliance to those, right? And we have a longer uh, journey already <laughs> behind us. So when, when I joined four twenty five years ago, we already looked at, um, at the subject. Um, and this is evolving over time, of course. But now we have 10 aspirational um, targets in um, environmental, social, and governance areas. Um, so uh, number one, of course, for this subject is uh, our carbon neutrality target in line with SPDI. So we, uh, we are uh, part of this uh, science-based target initiative, have their um, accepted targets um, to be their carbon neutral by 2050. And um, we, we have other targets around zero waste to landfill, responsible sourcing. Aurelia was already mentioning the importance of the supply chain, uh, what is really uh, important, but also um, uh, creating a diverse, truly uh, diverse culture. And um, as we are in the mobility sector, of course, uh, ensuring um, mobility and accessibility for all. Um, so the, the idea of the positive value um, of, uh, of uh, mobility. In Europe, we actually um, even accelerate in our strategy the carbon neutrality um, targets that we have on a global level, because we believe that this market is ready earlier and we hope that this can serve as a blueprint for other areas. So our corporate 2050 carbon neutrality target, we, we target to accelerate that to 2035, um, having 100% battery electric vehicles by 2030 uh, for the car sector, by 2035 for our light commercial vehicles, and also looking at our, our direct suppliers that they are carbon neutral. So quite comprehensive. And uh, we, we hope that this uh, sets also um, so, some examples for other uh, regions. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, of course, now, well, now we can be very, very proud to be Europeans when you say that Europe is actually leading, leading the environmental sustainability strategy or the implementation of it also. So uh, at least. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's, that's Other awesome. regions have other uh, focus and other, um, I mean, each re region has its, uh, its merits and, and they are um, focusing on, on various things where they are better. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but let's let's then move into Vincent because you you in your role you actually meet a lot of customers and uh, and and have various discussions about these topics all the time. So uh, now, kind of mirroring to what you heard from Aurelia and Wolf Peter already, uh, can you mention um, kind of the top uh, priority topics that you actually usually have um, when, when you meet the customers when you discuss with them at the moment? <laughs> Sure. Um, thank you, Rosa. So um, we mainly identify three main type of discussion that basically reflect in a way also the, the level of um, the data maturity of an organization for achieving net zero goals. So some of them are still in the starting point, right? They want mainly to comply with the regulation. They want to understand the value. Uh, they can gain from being net zero and how much data can enable such goals. So we articulate here some use cases, um, the visions, the, 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 we're working on the roadmap, on the, on, on the partners, the platform, and so forth. So some others are already keen to work on a more specific scope on their sustainability data. They, they want, for example, let's say to tackle emission data in their plants um, and implement some data foundation on top of their manufacturing execution system. So they want to tackle some logistics optimization um, and work on route optimization or inborn and outborn logis um, logistics solution. Um, some other want to better understand let's say a sustainability score of their supplier and implement an assessment or uh, whatever on, on the supplier side. And they also like um, for some of them to implement a carbon management solution to try and better measure emission in their value chain. So such cases at this stage are truly about embedding um, emission data into decision-making process, right? But this is not a scale. So the third one is more 
Um, and this concerns a few organizations, right, that they are working with us to basically deploy at scale such solutions, enabling but what we call a sustainability data hub uh, to support both the sustainability performance for all CXO, as well as the ESG reporting aspect. So these organizations are reaching the most advanced data-driven transformation journey I was talking about before. Okay. Um, very um, uh, interesting to hear about those sort of like maturity stages that you, that, that you mentioned there. Uh, we promised to actually go through some of the um, data for net zero report findings also today. So um, let's now dive quickly into that. And uh, Vincent, uh, to get us all on the same page, uh, I would actually ask you to define the most important uh, definitions that all of us should be aware of when we talk about sustainable uh, sustainability and especially environmental sustainability and net zero. Could you please do that? Yeah, it's not an easy task uh, that you ask me, uh, Rusa, but uh, let, let, let's try to, 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 to share some definition here. And I already heard also from Wolf people, um, SBTI, which is uh, uh, maybe an initiative um, that I can quickly describe for those who don't know about the SBTI. So the SBTI is main science-based target initiatives, right? And as an initiative, they provide some best practices, some guidance, some technical expertise, as well as some standards. So they recently, for instance, released, um, as far as I remember, it was end of last year, a set of uh, new net zero standards. And today there is nearly 1,000 organizations worldwide that are leading the transition to a net zero economy grounded in climate science through the SBTI. So this is a well-known initiative that when you are talking about net zero and sustainability, you, 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 you need to know. Then coming back to the net zero especially, um, so there is a lot of um, discussion about it and currently it's a bit, uh, 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 there is a lot of debate as well um, in some literature. Although there is no standardized definition at the corporate level, we um, currently rely on, as I mentioned, some standards such as the one provided by the SBTI. So net zero means um, having reduced emission in line with 1.5 degrees trajectory and coming as close as possible to the zero emission and also having extracted from the atmosphere an amount of the CO2 equivalent um, linked to your residual uh, emission, right? Um, so here, notice that we are also calling CO2, um, CO2 emission, mainly uh, linked to net zero. Uh, but basically that stands for all greenhouse gas emission that are affecting the climate change. So in fact, there is more than 40 greenhouse gas emission uh, that have been identified by the IPCC. Um, and however, only seven uh, GSGs uh, are targeted by the Kyoto Protocol. So these are the main definitions that we can uh, talk about it. We will most probably also touch point on the scope, scope one, two, and three, but maybe we will um, iterate that uh, later during our discussion. Definitely. Uh, thank you so much, Vincent, uh, kind of uh, giving that intro. And... Uh, Actually, um, I would be very happy first to hear, because uh, both of our panelists today, our guest speakers today, were included into our study as, as well. And uh, basically, how did we run the study is that we surveyed, surveyed uh, uh, 900 uh, executives from different sectors uh, across the world. Uh, we were really surveying, surveying uh, on what is the role of the data in converting these net zero ambitions into actions. And we were looking at uh, what are the key data related capabilities that organizations really need to build in order to accelerate their journey to net zero. And then, of course, uh, explored kind of the benefits that, that can be realized for embedding these kind of capabilities uh, and, and hence um, kind, kind of... Uh, 
uh, using the emissions data for decision making for the business, really. So, Wolf Peter, you also contributed to our research. So, could you highlight some of the uh, perspectives that you actually uh, brought uh, into into our uh, study? Mm -hmm. No, sure. Thanks. Yeah, I think that, that was about a long, longer survey and interview that that, that we had there, but. Uh, I believe one of the key messages that I try to uh, convey is how important the, um, the, the the top management, the top executive management commitment actually is. Um, the the journey uh, towards sustainability works best if really on the CEO and CFO level, um, there's a strong commitment behind that to, to understand the necessity that the, the company is transitioning um, as fast as possible in a more sustainable way and um, that they understand that this is important for, for um, the viability and sustainability of their own business model and drive that through the organization top down to overcome what we often see in particular in, in bigger corporations, this uh, clay of middle management that is otherwise um, slowing you down. So it is, um, I think, of utmost importance really to um, to have the top of the house uh, committed and drive that through. Um, otherwise you, you will be not fast enough. And um, and I think in, in the beginning we have heard about the urgency of the climate crisis. So it's about time um, to, to make progress there. Thank you, Wolf Peter. And uh, I totally agree that uh, basically with any change that you are driving throughout your organization, so definitely the top management support is or, or kind of it, that it's actually driven by top management even that way it is the is the one of the key success factors, right? So also, also in here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, but let's move a little bit deeper into... Um, uh, Brightlinks and Ford's um, uh, environmental sustainability journey. So both Aurelia and Wolf Peter, you come from um, kind of very different types of companies, but at, at the same time from companies that are very ambitious in your approach to sustainability. And uh, regarding Brightlinks, so actually went through the Brightlinks um, sustainability mission report. And uh, I learned that your sustainability mission is actually built on top of these five pillars that you also mentioned, Aurelia. Uh, could you a little bit share uh, about those, um, about the five pillars in your in your sustainability mission? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Rosa. So it should probably surprise <clears throat> no one here that these pillars were created following an exhaustive materiality assessment whereby we engaged internal and external stakeholders in a double materiality process in order to really define our priorities at Brightling in terms of sustainability. As a result of this, we were able to identify 10 priority topics in which we are pursuing these in each of the five pillars. So I've already introduced product and planet at the beginning. As well, I'll take the chance now to go through people, where obviously we're focusing on key issues such as employee engagement and well being, uh, diversity and inclusion, training and learning, other developmental activities, and really engaging our employees for the subject of sustainability. And Wolf Peter has already mentioned the importance of a top down approach. I can only reiterate that myself as well. And no doubt, um, as I think a lot of us have in mind, as well underline the importance of the bottom up approach. So one of the points that we really see to be fundamental in the people pillar is being able to engage our employees globally for sustainability. Fortunately, we're able to benefit from that management top-down approach to sustainability, including on topics such as climate action. And we're really able to then engage our employees as we did this last climate week. So complementing our announcement of becoming 100% carbon neutral with the fact that we took that entire week of climate week to engage our employees in tangible action. I mean, we do a lot in terms of reporting, managing, committing and aligning to, to global standards, but we also at the end of the day want to make sure that we're complementing this, which is also tangible action in and of itself, uh, but really with ha a hands-on approach. So we were able to take 
one week across Switzerland and our different locations and even beyond them to have a number of employees come out for a nature leave day where we were able to make a positive contribution to biodiversity in our local communities, whether it was cleaning up alongside a river in Zurich, which I was surprised at how much there was actually to do there, or whether it was on the mountainside in the Valais, uh, working with a local organic farmer. So that's, those are some of the key topics in our people pillar. Uh, we complement that as well with work in prosperity. So really aligning our values across the board and making sure that we have a positive contribution to the communities in which we operate both in our own operations and along the supply chain. And of course in progress where we really focus on making sure that we report on our progress made in a transparent manner and on an annual basis, according to the World Economic Forum, International Business Council Stakeholder Capitalism Metrics, in which we're a leader in our industry to do so. So I think that we feel very confident also having recreated our materiality assessment that we continue to hold the priorities that matter to our stakeholders within and, and importantly beyond Brightling. And that's something that we're looking to continue, looking forward to continuing to refine as we move ahead. Thank you. Um, so how about then Wolf Peter? I actually learned that uh, Ford has been the first OEM to start reporting on sustainability already 23 years ago. So obviously this is not a new thing for you in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, can you mention anything, how, how, how it has maybe changed that how you're using data differently now compared to 23 years ago uh, for driving the sustainability at Ford? Uh, so is there a difference? And, and if, if yes, uh, how, how is it different? Well, the, the principles are still the same. So um, I, I would say, yes, uh, we, we have been the first there. And um, of course, over time, this is always evolving. Yeah? So what is important is some consistency, I think, also. Uh, we, we report, uh, for example, our CO2 emissions of our uh, fleets over time, how they improve. and you can see quite impressive um, numbers, so to speak. But I think what may change there is a little bit um, that different subjects over time get more um, more, more importance than others. And um, this, this is a bit changing along the lines of the materiality uh, analysis that o Aurelia was already mentioning. Um, sometimes they are, um, they are, there are some subjects that get suddenly more in the focus and are then more um, also highlighted in a sustainability report um, than, than potentially a year um, before. But over, <clears throat> overall, we, we see in, in the way how we use the data um, also a little bit that we have these um, evolving databases in our company uh, where, um, where we have from different areas organically grown databases and that are over time uh, partly automated, and that makes it um, sometimes easier. <laughs> but then, um, on the other hand, um, in, because this is evolving so much over time, you, you also um, struggle then to, to bring them all together. And that's uh, what we are now trying to, to do, to uh, find ways to integrate um, all the data into um, in a more automated uh, way than before. Actually, we also integrated now the sustainability report in our general financial financial reporting before, uh, because we also see um, that sustainability is a core aspect of the overall business, and therefore we believe that such an integrated report is also the right uh, way going forward. And that's maybe also, uh, in a way, different in 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 the way how we uh, deal with data. Um, in, in, in the report going forward. Hmm. And uh, I, I think uh, now it's kind of a natural point to start a little bit talking about uh, kind of the emissions data management and uh, what kind of capabilities that requires. Uh, some of them already came up, for example, people perspective always being very important, of course, when we talk about data and so on. But uh, could, we, could you, Vincent, actually elaborate a little bit like uh, how do you see the concrete challenges that uh, today's companies have uh, or are facing uh, regarding um, emissions data? So, so are there some 
specific capabilities and skills that you see maybe lacking or you see such that should be developed further right now? Uh, that's a quick question to, to the panel in, in general, but um, from, from our perspective, um, challenges that we, we have, if we are looking at the scope one, two and three emissions, for example, right? The scope one emissions, emission data are pretty much under our control and we, we have um, good in-house data and, and, and a long experience. For the scope three emissions, uh, let's look at the upstream and downstream data, right? So the data from our suppliers and we come to that potentially later, but um, I'm, I'm, I want to focus here in my answer to the downstream <laughs> scope three emissions. So the use of our product by the customer. And the, um, the, the challenges that we, we have there is of course that, uh, for example, the uh, CO2 emissions from a car are heavily impacted by the way uh, the cars are driven. So the mileage, um, so, so how long on average are these vehicles are driven over the lifetime? Um, in what is the driving style? Where are they driven? Uh, where are they uh, driven? And so on. So you need to have there some uh, assumptions on top. If you have, um, if you are organizing that on a corporate level, you have also different um, regulated emission standards. So you are testing against different test cycles um, in US, in Europe, in other regions um, of the world. And then you need to try to bring that all together to one number for your CO2 um, scope three emissions. You can imagine there are a lot of assumptions behind that are then to be based on um, actually customer research data. So what do we see in the field? How um, are these vehicles used and how can we transfer from one regulated test cycle to the other, right? And, and of course, um, th th that's um, a, a, an obstacle and uh, we, we overcome that, as I said, with customer um, research and data from the field. Yeah, exactly. And I actually got a great question from the audience, which is very much related. So continuing from there, what you were mentioning about the scope tree um, kind of data uh, from, from the usage of your products, so the cars actually. So um, there was a question about what were the biggest obstacles in capturing emissions uh, data or what are and how, how do you all overcome them? So are, are there such that you could actually mention? Yeah, so, so the op you, you, you asked for other obstacles than what I mentioned for the downstream now or? Yeah, yeah, so mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure, sure. There are those obstacles that, okay, you kind of like you need to test the um, or have different scenarios, right, that you're mm -hmm. then testing, which actually affects on how you should estimate them. But are there any other obstacles, for example, technical? Do you have all the kind of capabilities in place um, to capture that data and then use that? Yeah, I mean, currently, I mean, this is also a new evolving area, right? So the connectivity mm -hmm. of vehicles will improve also the um, ability to assess what the um, CO2 real world emissions are or on road emissions are. So there's um, actually now a requirement in some regions of the world to actually um, track these data and um, and get there more information about that if there's a consent of the customer, so to speak, that these uh, vehicles can be used in an anonymized, anonymized way. So that's of course always with data, right? Data privacy is, uh, um, also um, often a thing that you need to also consider um, under the sustainability uh, agenda. Oh yeah, definitely. Hey, Aurelia, uh, 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 now that we talk about this sort of data management capabilities related to the emissions data, so I have understood that you have actually implemented a carbon management tool. So can you elaborate, um, because you already mentioned that basically you're not um, investing in this so much because of the regulations, but more because you want to really do your part. Uh, so what was the motivation behind it? And maybe the value that you were expecting from this, uh, from implementing this kind of technology? Mm -hmm. I mean, what we wanted to, to make our carbon accounting as efficient as Paul. So we worked for a couple of years with a more manual system. And after evaluating a lot of different solutions, we made the choice to adopt Salesforce Net Zero. Um, 
I think we lost Aurelia for a bit. Uh, let's see if, if we get her back. I, I'm sure that ha that will happen I, soon. I fear that would be my <laughs> my end. But maybe to clarify, yeah. also our carbon neutrality strategy is going beyond the regulation, right? So um, of course. actually um, there's no requirement to have 100% battery electric vehicles in, in Europe, but we believe it's the right thing um, to do. And I think what, what Aurelia was uh, starting there to say with the automation is actually what I also suggested, right? So that, yes, you are starting with a manual process in the very beginning, at the beginning of the century, and then you try to see what you can automate um, step by step in the uh, various er areas. Of course, if you have uh, legacy programs um, and databases, it's uh, often difficult to merge the different uh, standards that you have. Excellent. Um, so I have another question from the audience that we can take now when we are waiting for Aurelia to get back. Uh, so this is, of course, for Wolf Peter, since, since uh, you are here. So how well are you aligned with your organizational data department as part of your net zero journey? Um, as, as, of course, data management uh, will, will need to be a key enabler. Yeah, so, so we, we have there a very strong um, partnership and uh, we, we have actually two uh, organizations that look into data and software and they are uh, working to, on a global um, level also. And they are always looking for all new strategies that we have, what is it we can do, how can we help and how can we um, ensure that the existing databases can be um, utilized better for your purposes. So I'm, um, I, I, I wouldn't suggest that sustainability is a separate um, stream, just in, in contrast, right? So sustainability data, uh, for example, for the CO2 uh, values of our vehicles, they are integral part of the product development, of the product planning, the business planning, um, they are part of financial, um, uh, the financial planning also. And that's just one example how everything is really strongly uh, integrated. And that's also the, the reason, or, or I said, um, as I said before, why we integrate also our sustainability report in the overall financial reporting, or to bring that, uh, integrate that together in one report to just show that sustainability or carbon neutrality is not an add-on or separate thing, mm -hmm. but this is really the center um, of the business transformation going forward. No, but exactly. Uh, so it's sort of on, only a, like a new dimension to it, what you already have or what you already deal with, with your data, right? Okay, good. But uh, then uh, I would actually like to raise the topic of ecosystems and data ecosystems. So, so uh, actually most organizations, according to our report, fail to commit on all emission scopes and especially the scope three that we have been now discussing about. Um, so, and also one of the report findings was actually that uh, only 22% of the organizations say that they are even measuring scope three emissions. So, um, uh, regarding the um, scope three in our automotive sector, so Wolf Peter, I know that you, uh, Ford, uh, are part or uh, you, you are working in this Katina X ecosystem or consortium, which is a great example of, uh, I would say, a cross-industry um, uh, collaboration to solve different kinds of problems, of course, or different kinds of challenges together and bring even more value. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit about like what kind of topics you actually uh, work with in this consortium? And is there anything that you could share about the kind of the results or the value that it has brought already now? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. So, um, and, and maybe let me start um, that this is not the first time, right, that we as industry try to work together uh, while we are competing, of course. Um, we also try to find um, general, uh, in general, a standardized way to make it for suppliers easier to uh, provide data. For example, since centuries, oh no, sorry, decades, uh, the automotive industry has now this international made an international material data system where along the whole supply chain, the material data, substances and materials are provided 
and um, and this information is going really from from the raw material extraction to the um, to the uh, tier ten, tier one, and OAM um, um, up in this chain, right? And similarly, Catena X is also trying now to get all the information, like the carbon footprint of a vehicle. Uh, from the whole supply chain, from the raw material extraction through the uh, complex uh, supply chain um, to build their a digital twin, so to speak, of this um, uh, of this vehicle and get then the information um, for, for us uh, available, what is the carbon footprint um, there. And this is, uh, again, very important. And um, because as you, uh, if we move from uh, from the current, uh, internal combustion engines to uh, electric vehicles, the importance of the scope three emissions in the supply chain will improve. And therefore, um, again, whilst we compete as an industry, we're always looking for, uh, to support our suppliers, uh, driving there towards common standards and processes. And we have not only the work together there in Catena X, we have also drive sustainability uh, where we are um, establishing self-assessment questionnaires for the suppliers. And I think that's uh, one of the learnings there um, is also that we try to um, make it as simple as possible and as practical as, uh, as possible for the whole supply chain um, going forward. So in a nutshell, I think it's just important that we all agree on global standards. And I think the um, Catena X is a good example where based on existing standards we don't reinvent the wheel uh, but we try to automate everything and make it easier for suppliers to su um, submit data in an as lean and, and as practical way in in our really super complex supply chain that we have no but exactly and uh, uh vincent how would you complement this ecosystem uh topic from your perspective, uh, based on kind of the market market view that you have at the moment? So um, in my view, this is really much the hottest topic that we are currently discussing with uh, the client, because um, as um, Volkswagen spot on, um, in a way, uh, my scope at my organization is your scope three. Um, and this is um, an obvious use cases for a collaborative data ecosystem, right? So we're facing more and more uh, uh, discussion with our clients on that journey. And this is definitely uh, some data-driven transformation, transformation journey that we are discussing. But uh, if we want to illustrate that uh, with some concrete example, as it has been uh, uh, given by Vospeter as well, let me illustrate the scope three downstream for example um it's about the use of your product so we are here talking about typically the product performance and the product performance is uh, also a net zero problem so um, it, it is part of a bigger pro uh, of a bigger picture right and this is the transformation of the sales of the commercial side of the organization but if today you are designing a product let's say only based of your internal data, then you don't know the amount of your product that is recycled, um, what impact product dura durability and, and the lifespan of your product, right? And competitors who can make those decisions uh, will be able to produce some cheaper products and that last longer and have lower impact at the end. So it is about, um, just to illustrate some 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 discussion, uh, some performance topic uh, linked to the collaborative data ecosystem topic and relative to the scope three emission that we are uh, also discussing here. Yeah, I, I think I think it's really great that you're actually highlighting the the potential business value uh, from the scope three kind of the emission data um, uh, as as well. Um, great. Um, unfortunately, it seems like uh, we we couldn't get Aurelia back uh, today. So I think that we can actually start moving um, to uh, towards the end of the session. There was one question uh, when o Aurelia was mentioning that they have actually started to implement uh, Salesforce um, Net Zero Cloud uh, to collect their emissions data. 
but is there anything about the technological landscape, like how, how you are um, so, sort of building your data management or emissions data management capabilities that you could, Wolf Peter, mention uh, to complement what Aurelia kind of started? Uh, yeah, I think we 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 looking at the um, technology there. As I said, we we try to automate the existing uh, databases, and we always just start uh, with um, yeah f first understanding what are the master data that we have, where mm -hmm. where will they reside, um, and then see how how can we use that. Uh, to to serve our purposes, right? And um, it, it's one of the key challenges that we face there to continually continuously evolve and innovate. Then um, the, 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 this this process and the cloud um, data that Aurelia was starting to um, to speak about is of course uh, one um, easy uh, approach there, in particular um, across the different regions and uh, across the different functions to make sure. Um, also, that we can work together in parallel um, at the same uh, documents and the same uh, databases, so to speak, um, to uh, make their, their their progress, and also um, to um, have engagement of different areas. Aurelia was speaking about um, the employees. I mean, Ford has a quite long history of the Ford Volunteering uh, Corp, where um, basically. Uh, community uh, work is done and where we try to engage uh, the different employees, um, bringing in also their their experience from their community work. And we try to collect them from all the regions um, of the world, so to speak, um, and, and combine that then uh, real, real time into, uh, into our corporate tracking systems there. But I see that Aurelia is now back, so we should use her um your, your time while while the um internet stability is there on her end yeah no but exactly thank you so much for your answer wolf peter and indeed uh aurelia we started to discuss or you started to actually um describe how and why what was the expected value you started to implement this carbon management tool so uh please go ahead and, and kind of conclude your answer and really glad to have you back yeah, for sure. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. I'm glad to jump back in on that. So when we started using this tool, I mean, we really wanted to make our carbon accounting as efficient as possible for anyone who's ever done this uh, in any type of organization, especially an international organization with many subsidiaries and lots of different contexts for which you need to account. You know how hairy this can be. So we really wanted to streamline as much as possible. And after reviewing a number of different solutions, we decided upon Salesforce Net Zero Cloud as the best option for us. We're really happy with how it's enabled our reporting. And I mean, reporting is, as we know, you know, only one important part of the process. What it's really enabled us to do is also to carefully track emissions so we can really determine where we need to reduce those as well. And we're really looking forward to building upon our precedents of helping to upskill our suppliers in their existing knowledge of carbon management and related practices through this portal as well. And we are looking forward to using it, for example, for our science-based targets initiative submission and in addition, continuing to facilitate the reporting process going ahead. So I think this has been a really key part of our journey, just in order to bring this up to a management level that you see being enabled in other functions of the business. And it's really great to be able to be at that level of maturity now and be able to benefit from the greater efficiencies that it brings us. Thanks, Aurelia. Very good insights. Uh, I have actually a very interesting question from the audience um, regarding um, kind of organizational roles. Um, so uh, the question goes, who should be the driver agreeing on data sharing interfaces and playing roles within value chains? So measuring sustainability from assumptions to real usage information and its utilization. So who should be kind of driving Driving this, do you have any insights on it, um, either Wolf Peter or Aurelia? And of course, Vincent, you're, 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 um, you're. I'm happy to have you chip in if you have any insights how it's done elsewhere. Uh, 
it's a tough question, right? Um, yeah, I think I think it definitely depends on where you're at along the value chain in terms of what is being done, what's the nature of your business, what is the size. I mean, we definitely have some suppliers along our value chain where their process might be mirroring ours. They may even have a number of subsidiaries uh, as well internationally, where whereas we have others, for example, a specific gold mine where they really have one operation in place, where there you're really talking about how do you functionally gather primary data, which obviously, you know, their scope one and two are is our scope three. So that's something that we look at keenly with them and we really seek to support them in their efforts and sharing, you know, really what we need in order for our reporting and where possible to help them upscale their own initiatives. So for example, we worked with one gold mine from which we source 100% of their annual production. Uh, this is an artisanal and small scale mine in Colombia, which is accredited by the Swiss Better Gold Association from which we source 100% of our gold. And we were able to support them along with another entity to really complete uh, first and, and really best in class uh, <laughs> uh, within a small pool. Um, uh, carbon uh, accounting uh, process. And through that, we found out how much their reliance on a diesel generator during the rainy season was impacting their emissions. And we were able to deploy the Brightling Carbon Fund to support that. So apologies, that may have been a bit of a tangent. Um, but I think that that's a, maybe an example from our side in terms of the variation that you can have in terms of what's required from the different actors along the value chain, if that's all, at all helpful. Yeah. Well, I, I think if I Think about the examples that I brought up before uh, Catena X or IMDS. Of course, there's this cross industry um, working together, right? So, uh, where uh, the industry tries to align on, on global processes and works then in partnership together. Um, this, this cannot be, of course, dictated. There needs to be uh, a feedback uh, loop, understanding, okay, what types of data sharing. Um, is acceptable um, and, and, and feasible, but of course the the driver typically is then done in, in the automotive industry uh, typically by the um, um, auto manufacturers, the OEMs themselves, but all in, in, in partnership with the other um, stakeholders to make it practical. Are we still uh, having with Rosa or Rosa is no more there? I think. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I think oh, yeah. there was some, some kind of break. It's there. Can you hear me now again? Yes. yes. Okay. Excellent. Uh, sorry about that. But Vincent, uh, is there anything that you would add uh, to the to the roles or or kind of the owner ownership of these kind of processes uh, regarding uh, controlling the data and the uh, and the, in the process? I mean, um, as far as we've uh, facing with uh, some customer, the data sharing topics is mainly uh, handled both um, with the, 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 the CDO, right? Uh, so the data office, as well as um, the business owner who is in charge of um, uh, these specific uh, use cases. So typically from the supply chain side, we, we, we touch point the, the, the chief supply chain officer, but more broadly, the sustainability topic is quite um, difficult to tackle in terms of um, uh, uh, driving um, this sustainability data topic because it is a, a new data domain which is transversal compared to you know the historical data domain that um, uh, are within the organization such as uh, the product data domain, the manufacturing data domain, the supplier data domain. So there is. Um, um, kind of a new way of thinking um, data here as a, as a, as an enabler for also data sharing, but but firstly as as a as a data domain per se um, for the sustainability topic, and maybe another um, uh, uh, complementary uh, feedback on, on on who is driving that is that we are seeing more and more uh, the chief financial officer. Um, that is um, uh, driving um, this ESG reporting topic and, and which is more on the compliance aspect. Um, so I think it is also 
uh, interesting to, to, to bear in mind that the three main, let's say, CXO that should be involved are the chief sustainability officers, such as you know, uh, uh, Aurelia and Wolf Peter that we have here, but uh, also on, on the finance side, um, they are uh, more eager uh, to work on this uh, ESG uh, aspect and depending on, on the organization, they are pretty much uh, uh, involved as well on, on, on all this topic because typically uh, the finance will need also to assess um, the uh, financial impact of the disasters in terms of um, uh, producing some disclosure on that topic. So there is some new um, uh, also uh, key stakeholders uh, that will need to uh, be part of this uh, uh, sustainability data topic. Uh, great insights, thank you. We actually got, um, or we have a couple of minutes time and uh, we actually want to conclude with some kind of recommendations or tips from both of our panelists or guests or from Aurelia and Wolf Peter. Um, I could already guess already that Wolf Peter could mention the following topics that I will actually ask you. So this is a question from the audience. Uh, okay. There was already a discussion about the C-suit support. So, so the kind of the top management support, uh, especially in pr helping to break through the clay that can be middle management layer. Um, so of course, all the all the data in the world cannot break through that kind of clay. So, what is the role of corporate training and and uh, uh, kind of uh, relay, related uh, functions in in really like gaining that kind of top management support and like implementing it all the way into the organization? I mean, data are of course important to get this um, uh, support in the first place. Right, so data play their a role to, to make sure that um, uh, the executives are convinced. And this can be also part, of course, then of the uh, education and training um, to the middle management and the whole organization, um, actually. So training <clears throat> is, is an important part. And it's part to also what Aurelia suggested, the uh, employee engagement. Um, that's an important bit. But um, the, the beauty of this top-down approach is also that uh, you include it in the objectives um, of the management. So, and um, with that, you are overcoming uh, with a mixture of data that are convincing, with objectives that are quite individual and uh, uh, targeted at each uh, manager, so to speak, uh, for her or his uh, part of how to translate sustainability in, in, in real world and training to bring um, the whole uh, culture with you. And that's, I think, important that there's a mindset uh, approach and therefore, of course, training and also um, other uh, human uh, resources related activities can help to, to move the whole organization along on this journey. Thank you, Wolf Peter. Uh, I think that is very concrete. And then over to Aurelia. So what would be uh, the tip from your side uh, uh, to share with the, with the companies that are maybe just getting started um, on, on really like managing and uh, using the emissions data to, to advance their targets regarding sustainability. I think Aurelia, you're on mute. Thank you, Rosa. So yeah. I would definitely second what Wolf Peter said. And what I would also say, especially if you're just at the process of getting started, and I was just there two years ago, so I know what it feels like. And I know that it can really feel like you're in the weeds and maybe you're overwhelmed with questions and possibilities and stress. So what I would find really helpful at that time is something really simple. Uh, it's just a visioning exercise. So maybe imagine if you know you could have all of your wishes come true with regards to data management and uh, your expectations and your targets for being able to reduce your environmental impact imagine where you would want to be in five to ten years time and i think that's a good way to really take a lot of this noise and um, other inputs that are in the process which are all really valuable and focus on them in a way that helps you to think in a more outcome oriented manner that can maybe a bit remove some of the stress in the process and help you to really or and your resources along the way. So that's those are my final words there. Thank you so much, Aurelia. I think with these words, so let's imagine a uh, kind of better future 
or more sustainable future and uh, plan our actions based on that. It's, it's a good way to end our session today. I want to thank you, uh, especially the panelists, of course. It was really, really ple pleasure to have you with us here to, to share your experiences and then Vincent sharing your experience from, from the market. Thank you so much. And uh, especially for the audience, of course, thank you for uh, uh, listening and joining and, and being so active with the questions as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye.